data. So Zeppelin kinds of unifies both of those, it gives you a lot of, uh, to, it enables you to tool properly and you are able to connect to different big data sources and you are able to visualize it pretty much interactively if you are using something like Hive or Spark. Uh, now if you talk to data analysts typically what they do is they are looking at a problem set and uh, uh, their biggest problem is uh, the dreaded CLI and the problem is that it is not at all interactive, it gives them a lot of trouble and if you want to look at trends or try to do exploratory data analysis, it becomes a problem. If you want to visualize or if you want to identify what kind of trends are in your data, it becomes very difficult to work with just the CLI. Uh, version 2 was Zeppelin and uh, we are in point right now talking about Spark because Libby works very closely with Spark and we will come to that. Uh, the analysis uh, with just Zeppelin without the Libby interpreter and with the Spark interpreter was definitely a step up. You could visualize a lot of data but there were multiple problems because typically what happens is whether it is a data analyst or a scientist, he is uh, generally working in a team. He has multiple things to do and uh, even in a notebook what he is trying to do is taking a data set and making it smaller or trying to expand that data set over a period of time. But the entire analysis requires a team to work on it and uh, just one person working on it will not be sufficient. Now uh, the other problem is that if you do not have sandboxing for every user who is using uh, Zeppelin then it is also a security problem. So most of the enterprises who want to deploy Zeppelin uh, in production, they need a sandbox environment and they basically need the entire user identity to be propagated not only at the authentication or the notebook level but also to the data level or to the data system level. So the identity should go to say a Spark or a Hive or whatever else interpreters that uh, that person or team is using. So this is uh, what our colleague, another colleague of ours, Prabhjot Singh namely said, look, this is interactive analysis 3.2 when basically comes to Zeppelin and Livy. Uh, now instead of using directly the Spark interpreter, we are saying that let us use Livy interpreter. Livy is another, uh, it is a Cloudera project right now and it is a Spark job server. Uh, we actually did quite a, uh, when we were uh, talking about this whole thing in the community, we brought up the design. We uh, kind of did a comparison between Apache Tori and Apache Livy, or oh sorry, uh, Cloudera Livy and we figured out that Tori is great when it comes to writing spark magics and doing multiple interpreter kind of things in a user oblivious fashion. So if you are uh, submitting a spark uh, SQL versus a spark, uh, a PySpark job, you would not know. But the problem was that Tori was not ready when it came to RESTful interactions. And given the way that Zeppelin is structured right now, I think uh, so we came to the conclusion that probably Livy is better suited to the needs of Zeppelin. So we ended up integrating with Livy. Uh, just a brief on Zeppelin. Uh, so the good news is that Zeppelin graduated and became a top level project in May 2016, uh, just about a month and a half, uh, maybe not, not even that much. Uh, it was incubated and this has been going since 2014. There are a limited set of committers right now. So our colleague Prabhjot Singh is a PMC over there and another couple of colleagues are on the verge of becoming committers. Uh, the community has grown quite a bit. In the last three weeks, the amount of check-in that we have seen in Zeppelin is very, very exciting and very encouraging. It basically shows there is a lot of interest in the uh, user or in fact even in the development community and of course we are getting more and more uh, inputs or rather questions from our customers. Over 1000 JIRAs have been filed, there are about 900 pull requests via the community and we also contribute significantly to that. Uh, uh, there was a little bit of a, a problem with the R interpreter but we managed to tide over that and we uh, have the most recent interpreter as R. Uh, the recent updates uh, from a Hortonworks standpoint, we have committed ourselves to the enterprise readiness theme. So we would basically work on security, uh, authentication, getting it stable, scalability, those are some of the themes that we have decided to contribute to in addition to building some of the scalable visualization bits but only on the back end. The front end is pretty open and that is the way Zeppelin has been designed. It is pretty much like an open closed principle. You have left the design open so if somebody wants to plug in a new interpreter they should be able to do and uh, the visualizations are also going to be plug in. So Helium is something that is being worked on in the community. I think in the next few months you will see more updates on that. 
Uh, one of the bigger changes that came in was now we have a generic JDBC interpreter. One of the bigger problems was that earlier people would have to run multiple interpreter processes to work with different backends. So if you were writing a Phoenix query on top of HPS, you would have to go and write a new interpreter. Now we've basically collapsed all of that and brought inside a, a generic JDBC interpreter. Authentication and authorization at a notebook level was not available, so that was a, ma a massive upgrade. Uh, in fact, that also came out from the community. We ended up reviewing it and helping, but uh, it was a pretty big change. Uh, we have contributed to the UI automation through Selenium. That has been uh, one of the bigger pain points because between releases, you don't want things to break. And uh, UI, or in fact, QE is a critical part of it. And therefore, that's uh, an area of interest for us. Uh, security for other interpreters. So like I mentioned earlier, we've integrated with Livy and the uh, user identity propagation along with Kerberos and Spinego integration is available only for the Spark path. But probably by the end of July, uh, we will be able to uh, get security for some of the other interpreters as well. Uh, of course, needless to mention that we are in a release grind at Hotmarks, so this activity might be a little bit delayed. Uh, so some of the usage patterns and feedback that we've received so far, although we've not announced a GA yet, we've done about four tech previews so far, the last one being in May. Uh, the tech preview that we did in May works with HDP version 2.4.2, and with this upcoming release of Hortonworks HDP 2.5, uh, Zeppelin, Livy, all of these will be available via HDP and will be completely available via uh, Ambari and will be managed by Ambari. Now, a couple of products that we have internally uh, built, they are basically for cluster monitoring and network analysis and stuff. And some of these screenshots have been taken through that. You'll probably hear a lot more about SmartSense in uh, probably one of the other sessions. And, and of course, the general announcement for SmartSense will also happen along with uh, 2.5. In fact, that's a tech preview. It's not a general announcement. Uh, but some of the other customers who we spoke to, uh, and in general, during meetups, what we figured out is uh, one of the telecom customers, they wanted to, to figure out what was the path that concert attendees took while coming to a concert. So they basically took a bunch of data from a telecom provider, uh, did the lat-long analysis, and then plotted all of that on a geographical graph to figure out what was the path that these people were going to take to come to a concert and probably advertise on those paths. So interesting use cases that people are solving with it. For us, the most interesting uh, is cluster management itself, and therefore SmartSense is something uh, that is of a lot of interest. Uh, just one more point on that. So uh, data scientists, when we spoke to most of them, uh, they wanted to work in groups, and they didn't want somebody else to uh, kind of destroy what they've already done. They wanted their work to be pristine, and they wanted to work on that, and that was like one of the biggest motivations. Uh, so since some of this feedback is pre-release uh, of the work that we have done, in, including Livy and stuff, uh, we keep getting a lot of complaints about user separation, security, and all of that, sandboxing, et cetera. Uh, this is just upcoming. So Zeppelin will be available with HDP 2.5 and Ambari 2.4, uh, 2.4.0. And the ETA is uh, roughly end July, but I will uh, basically cover all of this through a short demo. Uh, quickly on the Zeppelin architecture, like I mentioned, it is multi-layered architecture. Uh, at the client level, you have basically a JavaScript-based uh, front end written completely in Angular, and that interacts with the Zeppelin server via WebSockets and HTTP REST calls. And Underneath that is where the whole magic is. So each of these interpreters, when you have either a Livy interpreter or a Spark interpreter, that runs as a process. And you can choose to plug or club mo uh, multiple of these interpreters inside an interpreter group and run it inside a JVM. Now, uh, what it gives you is that you could basically write your own uh, user-defined functions in whatever language you choose and load that through the class loader, create a new interpreter group of yourself, and deploy it in Zeppelin. Of course, you would end up using, uh, if you are intending to use some uh, big data tools such as HBase or Phoenix or whatever, then you're probably better off using the existing interpreters. But should the need arise, you will be able to uh, write a simple interpreter pretty quickly. Uh, and that's the beauty of it, the extension of it. If you want to include another tool set in your whole analysis process, then you can just go create another interpreter, start using that. 
So uh, multiple steps, collate and load data. So you can collate and load data from existing data sources or from external data sources. When you bring it inside a notebook, you'd probably do a little bit of data mangling because that is typically required before you can arrive at your final results. Uh, the visualization is pretty robust and with Helium going to get more powerful in the next three to six months, I think we'll see better features over there. Like I mentioned, collaboration is an important feature and uh, uh, we, uh, after we've done a little bit of stability and performance, we'll probably focus on uh, these areas. The idea is that if there are multiple people working on the same notebook and if they're working on the same data source and some user has brought down the size of the data from say about 10 GB to about a few MBs, then you don't want another user to run that same query again because that's a, use, a, a, a waste of compute. And in that case, what happens is if two users then start using the same notebook and the same data, then you need attribution and very strong data lineage. Uh, and therefore auditability and stuff. So uh, before we start exposing the UI features, I think we'll have to build a robust backend for this. Uh, that is going to happen in the future. Uh, some popular usage scenarios that we've seen is customized dashboards. Uh, uh, an airline company was doing uh, dashboarding for the parts they receive at the time that they receive and they were doing it uh, pretty much customizable. Security analytics, I think we've just announced Metron a little while earlier, although a lot of work has been going on. Uh, Zeppelin is also being used to do PCAP analysis and all that for uh, Metron. And biosciences, a uh, couple of clients, uh, rather customers, they were using it for doing some kind of uh, data research on or whatever medicine trials or something. Uh, I don't have exact details on that, but again, the chief requirements for them were basically security and stuff. Uh, so with that, why did we want to bring multi-tenancy and what was our motivation to do that? The objectives were very simple. We wanted to support different uh, multiple workloads of multiple customers. So even within an organization, you have advertising, you have marketing, and everybody wants to do their own an analysis. Now at the YARN level, we have the ability to distribute those jobs, but we didn't have that ability at, uh, at, at Zeppelin level. Uh, and you also want to do fine-grained audits. So for example, if the application is run by a person, a user uh, in a particular queue, you want to be sure that you have the ability to go back and track what they did. And uh, the requirements to do such a thing was basically you were unable to provision multiple user groups. So while you were running everything via YARN, everything was running as Zeppelin user and that wasn't good, which meant that everything was getting submitted to the same queue and therefore you end up probably destroying the cluster. Uh, and we didn't have the ability to share state or data with other users. So now with Livy, we have a little bit of ability on, on those areas. Okay. Uh, so like I mentioned, the authentication and authorization came in uh, via the Shiro integration that came through the community. So now you can configure either your LDAP or your local users and have them authenticate before they start using the notebook. So they can log in with their username and password, log into Zeppelin, and then starting from there, you basically submit a job to the Livy interpreter instead of directly submitting it to the Spark interpreter. Now one of the key differences, in, and Jeff will probably get into it uh, in a little more detail, is that when you use the Spark interpreter, you're using Spark client versus when you use Livy interpreter, you're using Spark submit. You get user impersonation, and the beauty of Livy right now, from our perspective, is that it basically gives you a RESTful interface where you can just go and submit the piece of code. And when you try to execute that code on your cluster, you know that you're basically sandboxing with the user that you have logged in as. So if you have logged in as, say, Bob, then Bob is the guy who is actually running the job on Spark. Uh, the whole thing will also come with uh, 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 built-in security. So if you carburize your whole cluster using, say, an Ambari, then you can basically use the same key tabs and connect to Livy and subsequently to Spark. Uh, I'll just hand over to Jeff for the deep dive on Livy. Thanks, Loki. So now I will talk about the uh, more detail about the Livy. Uh, so what is Livy? Uh, Livy is a uh, REST, is open source REST interface for interacting with the uh, Spark yeah, from anywhere. So here is a, a diagram of the uh, overall architecture of the Livy. 
So in this diagram, you can see that the, uh, it has three layers. In the most left is the Livy client. In the middle is the Livy server. So the Livy client communicates with the Livy server using uh, REST API. That means they communicate with each other use uh, HTTP protocol. And the Livy client can ask the Livy server to do a lot of things, such as uh, uh, launch uh, uh, Spark jobs and pull the job status, and even submit uh, one piece of Spark code. So on the left is the uh, Spark session. Currently, uh, Livy supports two kinds of uh, Spark session. One is the uh, interactive model, uh, the other is the batch model. So uh, since today's talk is about the uh, interactive analysis, so we will focus on the interactive session. And the, uh, the Livy server uh, communicates with the Spark session using the uh, HTTP protocol uh, when, uh, in the Livy 0.1. And in the Livy 0.2, it is changed to the RPC uh, due to some uh, security reason. So overall, Livy is just a central place to uh, submit spa jobs. And it can bring us several benefits. First is that uh, it can reduce the pressure on the, uh, on the client machine. So uh, nothing will happen on the client machine. Just, you just need to call the REST API. And uh, the second is that it can make the job submission and monitoring much easier. So uh, without Livy, when you, when you need to submit Spark job, you need to install the uh, Spark on your client machine. And then you need to use the Spark submit to submit your uh, Spark submit script to submit your Spark jobs. But uh, with Livy, you just need to call the REST API. You do not need to install anything on, the, uh, on your client machine. And uh, actually, we, we, are, uh, we encourage uh, the Levy user to use the cl uh, young cluster model. Uh, although you can just use the local model and the young client model, but young cluster model can uh, distribute all the workload to the young cluster. So it, it can just reduce the uh, pressure on the client machine. The third is that uh, it can uh, customize the uh, job schedule, since all the jobs is submit through the Levy server. So it's really possible for us to customize the, uh, the job scheduling. Uh, although it's, this feature is not implemented yet, but it's really possible for us to do that. So now let's uh, see how the Levy works for the interactive uh, session. So before you submit any piece of code to the Levy server, you need to create a session. So here we use the curl command to uh, create the, the, uh, to invoke the uh, REST API. Uh, this is a post request, and uh, in this request, we need to specify the kind. The kind now, in this example, the kind is uh, Spark. We can also specify it as PySpark, as Spark R. Now, this is the response that we get. Uh, this response contains the session state and the proxy user, the session ID, and its center. So now let's see how uh, that works. First, the Livy client sends this that request that, uh, to the uh, Livy server through uh, REST API. And then the Livy server will create that uh, SPA interactive session. And after that, in SPA interactive session is created, it will send back its address to the Livy server so that the communication between the Livy server and the, the uh, SPA session can be established. So finally, the Levy server will send back the uh, session state to the uh, Levy client. Uh, now let's see how, the, uh, how we execute code in the Levy. So this is the uh, uh, REST API for uh, uh, execute code. In this API, we need to specify the, the code you need to uh, run. And also, uh, you need to specify the uh, REST API URL. This is the response that we get. Uh, the response contains the, uh, the statement ID, the stage, and the output. Uh, you may notice that here the output is none. This is just because that piece of code cannot finish in a short time. But we can just get the output by calling another uh, uh, poor job status API. So now let's see how that works. First, the Levy client sends that uh, request to the uh, Levy server, and Levy server will forward that request to, the, uh, to the, its Spark session. 
And that bus station will execute that code and send back the output to the Levy server. Finally, the Levy server will send, out the, send back the output to the Levy client. Uh, the next thing I'd like to talk about is Spark context sharding. Uh, since all the jobs, uh, the client do not own the Spark station because all the Spark station are launched by the Levy server. So it's really possible for us to do the Spark context sharding. In this diagram, we can see that the uh, client one and client two, they use the same session, session one, while the client three use the uh, session two. So when the client uh, uh, send, uh, send the request to the Levy server, he need to uh, specify the session ID. So for now, it's very straightforward that if you want to share the same uh, Spark context, you just need to specify the uh, same session ID. But it is, uh, in the secure model, it's more complicated. Uh, yeah, and that's the next thing I would, I'd like to talk about is the uh, uh, security stuff in the Levy. So uh, there's three main problems that we need to address. The first problem is that we'd like to make sure that only authorized user can launch the Spark session and submit Spark, Spark code. We do not, need, uh, do not want anyone to uh, ask the Levy server to uh, launch the Spark session. The second thing is that uh, we'd like to uh, make sure that each user can access his own session. We'd like to protect his uh, session. The third thing is that only the Levy server can submit job security to the Spark session. So in order to address these three problems, we uh, use several techniques. The first is uh, Spangle. Uh, the second is uh, in personalization. Uh, the third thing is the uh, shared secret. So I will talk about them uh, one by one. So uh, the first thing is a Spangle. Uh, Spangle is, uh, the full name is simple and uh, protected GSS API negotiation uh, mechanism. And it is GSS API uh, student model, or uh, student mechanism used by the client server uh, client server software to negotiate with uh, the choice of the security technology. So the underlying security technology is pluggable, but most of the time we use it with the uh, Kerberos. So now let's see how that works. First, the client will uh, issue a request to the Levy server, and then the Levy server will respond with uh, status code 401. 401 means that it is unauthorized. Then the client we are sending another request again. And in this request, it will put the uh, Kerberos ticket information on this uh, HTTP request. And the Levy server will authorize the user using the uh, ticket information and then respond with the uh, collect content. So the next thing is about uh, impersonalization. Uh, we don't want to use Alice to access user Bobber's session. We just want to protect each one's session. So here we use the impersonalization. Uh, so the impersonalization in Livy just like the uh, impersonalization in Hive Server 2, if you know that. So in order to enable the impersonalization in Livy, we need to add this uh, configuration to the uh, Livy configuration file. Uh, without the impersonalization, uh, actually, the Levy server run as the uh, super user Levy. So without impersonalization, all the spa session is run as the uh, user Levy. But when, when, uh, when, uh, when us enable the impersonalization, every spa session is run as the user of the client. That means the, the first session is uh, uh, run as the user Alice. The second session is run use uh, Bob. So the next thing is about the shared secret. So once the Spark session is launched, it can accept requests from the outside. So, but we just want only the Levy server can send the request to the Spark se session. So how can we ensure that? Here we use the shared secret. Now let's see how we do that. First step, Levy server will generate that secret key. 
The second step is that Levy server will pass that secret key to that spot session when launching the spot session. So that means only the Levy server and that, that spot session knows that secret key. The final step is that the Levy server and that spot session will communicate with each other using the uh, secret key. Okay, so uh, now next we will uh, do the demo. Yeah, okay. So the first thing that I wanted to cover was it's off. Is it? Okay, it's back. So the first thing I wanted to show as part of the upcoming release is the complete ability of uh, managing Zeppelin and Livy with a Murray. Uh, this will start coming out in 2.5. Uh, so this is available as any other service that you would install on your cluster. Similar to that, you have a Zeppelin notebook which is running. Uh, it gives you all kinds of alerts, whether it's up or running or not. Provides you complete ability to do rolling and express upgrades and gives you another quick link, which I already have open here. Uh, in terms of configs, I just want to talk quickly about the, uh, the Shiro config that you need to put to ensure that uh, you have authentication established between Zeppelin and your LDAP or whatever. Now in this case, what I have is essentially uh, local users. So I've configured this with admin users and their different roles. And the security provider that I've used is basically just the session manager. Now instead of having local users, you could also choose to have LDAP based users, whatever your LDAP is and whatever is the LDAP that is being used for authenticating uh, POSIX user on your big data systems and stuff. Uh, the rest is uh, fairly straightforward. You want to basically put a certain set of memory, uh, a certain amount of memory and uh, put in some of the other configurations. I would probably skip some of these. If you have some custom configurations, then you can add it to both environment and config properties. Uh, I'm logged in as uh, admin user on this particular session. And before I show the multi-tenancy demo, I just want to cover a few things on this. Uh, in terms of interpreters, uh, you have multiple options. You have Angular interpreter if you want to do custom visualization. JDBC, like I mentioned, now connects to Hive, Phoenix, HBase, all of those. Uh, and the idea is that you, are able, you will be able to put your driver classes as dependencies. If those dependencies are available in Maven repositories, it will go and download it and install it inside your cluster. If not, then you can provide them at a fixed path on the cluster machine. Uh, Livy is also configurable as an interpreter, so you can basically put all these different parameters depending upon how you want to use it. Our recommended mode of usage is YARN cluster. We want customers to use this in uh, cluster mode. And you have to provide the endpoint for uh, Livy. Uh, uh, the, the rest are fairly straightforward. There is a lot of similarity between configuration of the Spark interpreter and the Livy interpreter. Uh, I'll just go back and show you one notebook. So if you look at it, this is basically a complete notebook which has multiple paragraphs uh, using shell interpreters on the top to dependency injection in between. So you could basically load libraries which are not available over here. Uh, to MD for, let's say, some instructions that you want to put inside the notebook itself. To Livy, which is used to uh, run Spark jobs. So this is written in Scala. And you get a lot of data now. And then you could basically say that, OK, let me write uh, the SQL inside Spark. Although we do support Livy. Uh, I mean, you could write Livy.sql as well because that's a property. But in this notebook case, I just want to combine all of these. And then you could choose any of these visualizations depending upon what kind of uh, visualization makes more sense in your uh, given case. And in addition to this, you could use your Angular interpreter, use the variable, and change the visualization type. Depending if, if there is a particular job type that you run very frequently, then you might want to invest in that. Uh, there will be a few more out-of-the-box uh, visualizations in the coming months. 
So that is pretty much it. Uh, now as far as uh, the multi user and multi tenancy aspect of it, so at this point in time uh, this is basically my Libby server which is running on port 8998 and it is showing me all the sessions that exist right now in the cluster. So there is no session right now. I will go back to a very simple notebook which is just trying to figure out what is the version of Spark on the cluster and I will just run all the paragraphs over here and if you now come back to sessions you will see that these sessions have been, wow, okay. And this is the yarn, okay. All right. Probably try to log out and log in. looks like Livy is down, we will just check that. So now Livy is also available as a Spark in, uh, as a Spark component. So just by looking at this place we can figure out whether it is up or not, seems it is up. In any case I will just try to do this again. Well, I think uh, our demo has uh, gone wrong uh, and I do not think I have. Uh, so we let me be around and we will be able to show you uh, in a few minutes from now but really sorry that the demo is busted. But essentially I have some old records from here. Now if you look at this, uh, these are YARN applications that were submitted in the past while we were attempting to set up this demo. Now earlier you were submitting uh, jobs using Zeppelin when you did not have authentication and then subsequently all the fresh Livy sessions would come with admin user or user 1 or user 2 and they would essentially exit or succeed based upon the capacity which was available on the local cluster that we were trying to run this on. Uh, these applications, uh, the status of these applications will be available via YARN and uh, if you would like to modify the uh, memory that you want to allocate to certain users and allocate them to different groups then you could go to the capacity scheduler inside Ambari and change those configs. Uh, sorry we were not able to demo the multi user and multi tenancy but we will be available in 5 minutes from now and uh, we will probably attempt to do another demo. Yeah. Yes. So the first thing that we do is we look at whether the service is up or not and then the second thing that we do is basically go to the var log uh, Libby server outputs and, and then we look at the Zeppelin results and whether we were able to make a submission or not. If we were able to make a submission then what happened? If this does not show us enough results then we again go back to yarn and start debugging from there. Any questions? Yeah, yeah, that has been fixed. So if you look at the latest JDBC interpreter, uh, you will be able to use that. Uh, but did you mean something like Spark that you already have a context? No, I do not think that is available. Yeah, because the difference between Spark and Hive is that Spark gives you a context and then that gives you an RDD and you can keep plugging in and you can say I want to query on this row or on this column, which I do not think we have an ability right now. I think once LLAP comes into play then Hive will also have similar abilities. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Zeppelin doesn't have so much of a manager if you think of it. Uh, 
Uh, sure. So that would basically be an abstraction on top of Zeppelin. Uh, I mean, not on top of Zeppelin. It is definitely required in Zeppelin that you have HA ability. Uh, but even at a granular level, per instance, you will still need multi-user and multi-tenancy. Uh, so I kind of get your point. And HA. So at this point in time there is no metadata store. So for example, if there was some user specific information that you had to store, in a real HA scenario, you would like to store that even when that particular instance went down. So I, I don't think we have started work on that yet. Yeah, there is a GitHub pull request which is being worked on. Uh, there is a little bit of confusion. Some of our customers uh, want complete Git protocol implementation. And the community is slightly uh, wary of that. So we want to basically take the first step, integrate with GitHub, uh, give the ability to import and export via GitHub, put the versioning information over there, and then start thinking about a complete implementation. So that should be available pretty soon, within the next month, I would assume. Yeah, so uh, those problems will be solved with 2.5. So now Zeppelin is going to basically run as its own user, will write logs as its own, and all the interpreters will also start running as Zeppelin user. So, uh, so if you think of it, that was more of we created that package and go do it yourself. But now with 2.5, I think we guide the user rather than telling him do it yourself. Not yet. Uh, what I can though tell you is that on the, so Zeppelin notebooks will also be available as Ambari views and this is strictly from HDP standpoint. Uh, at a view level you can configure going forward uh, what is the time period of logs that you want to preserve. So you could use that feature but as a standalone uh, a deployment I don't think that is supported yet. Uh -huh. Okay, I'll just go back to that. Twenty-three. Yeah, that'll be a long way away. I mean, did you mean from a Livy perspective as how two users got into the same Spark session? Do, do you mean the uh, impersonalization? Is this one line? Yeah, so, so uh, for each Spark session, uh, one Spark session corresponds to uh, one uh, Spark context. So when the client uh, issue request to the Levy server, for example, the client want to uh, submit one piece of code to the Levy server, can need to specify the station ID. So as long as key specifying the same station ID, they are using the same Spark session. That means they use the same Spark context. Yeah, Maybe you to that. yeah. yeah. Yes, that's why this is. Uh, I don't. I. I don't think we currently we encourage user to do that because this is insecure, right? <laughs> but in the future, yeah, we, we we need to add some uh, security mechanism to protect the session. Yeah, we both need to share the session, and we need both to protect the session. Yeah. So Livy is not doing the SSO for us. Livy is basically passing on the authentication parameters that come from Zeppelin. 
So if you look at the API of Livy, it basically enables you to uh, provide a parameter called proxy user. And that proxy user basically is the authenticated session from Zeppelin. Uh, yeah. Between Livy and Zeppelin. Okay, so it's both. Yeah. Okay. So it's secure all the way. So from Zeppelin to Livy to Spark. Well, Ambari is not yet a single sign on. Uh, but you could use it independently. The only problem is that you'll have to set up your own key tabs and uh, use those. Yeah. Yeah. You can use those. Okay. All right. So yeah. yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And,